Well, welcome, dear Executive Vice President Vestager. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here at the college. It's not your first visit uh, to, uh, to the college. Uh, but I have for the first time the honor and the pleasure to welcome you uh, personally. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Vice President Vestara uh, has, before she assumed the re European responsibilities, uh, which we very well know about, uh, had a very um, distinguished, important career at the Danish national level. She's certainly also not a stranger to higher education, because for three years, Commissioner Vestager was a minister for education in uh, Denmark. It's some time ago, but uh, you come with the uh, expertise also at the most senior level of uh, higher education uh, challenges. Um, uh, Commissioner Vestager has also been economic and interior affairs minister in, in uh, Denmark. And um, has become, um, before she uh, left for the European responsibilities, also Deputy Prime Minister of, of Denmark. I think here at the college, we probably know you best as uh, one of uh, the most remarkable, if I may say so, it's a personal assessment, commissioners responsible for competition policy from 2014 to 2019. Uh, you have retained responsibility for competition policy, but you are now, if one also looks at the website, is very prominently the commissioner for Europe fit for the digital age. So your portfolio has been uh, much uh, enhanced. But the subject you will address us on uh, to, uh, today, keeping the EU competitive in, in a green and digital world, um, has still a strong focus on the com competition, um, competition side. And um, I must say that competition policy is very often seen as a policy which has uh, uh, perhaps a primary reason of being because it's crucial to the functioning of the internal market, but it is very much a policy in the interest of the citizens because we are all consumers and therefore a competition policy has the aim, and I think you have made the point always very strongly, to defend our rights as citizens as well. So it's very much, I think, a policy close to the core of what the European construction should be about. There are clearly uh, some new challenges for competition policy, which stem both from uh, the enormous development of the digital uh, context, and also the question of our rights and values are to be posed in a different context now because of the challenges of the digital age. And of course, there are also implications of um, climate change challenges. And uh, you combine in your title all these different dimensions, which uh, um, is already a fascinating choice. If I may just add that the College of Europe has, of course, always given uh, great and due attention to competition policy. So not only have we had competition policy always as part of the curriculum, of course, primarily for the students from law, but not only, because of course, also in the economics program and uh, in other programs, it's taken into account, including in our program in uh, Natalin on the other campus. Um, one has to, to, uh, to say that um, probably one of the major institutional investments which the College of Europe has made is in the Global Competition Law Center, uh, which uh, is now in its 15th year, has just had its 15th annual conference, and I'm very glad that the director of our Global Competition Law Center, uh, uh, Damien Gérard, could, uh, could join us. And uh, I think the fact that we have established this center and that's a very uh, lively, well, a developing uh, center, and I had once the occasion to welcome you at one of the annual conferences of the GCLC is an indication that we as a college really take this dimension very, very seriously as part of our mission. So all this to say, you are most uh, welcome, we are most grateful that you have taken out the time, your busy schedule, to address us um, this, I can now say, nearly evening on this uh, subject. And uh, I think this year, this has been one of the fullest audiences we have seen at the college, and we have still an overflow room on the other side, so the interest is clearly very much there to listen now to you. Thanks very much.
thank you very much for this uh, warm welcome. And you wouldn't believe how happy I am to see you because we were driving round and round and I thought, oh, we are enchanted in Bruges. <laughs> uh, but I know that one can leave because I have excellent alumni from here in, in my cabinet. Uh, but that may not only be the only uh, reason why I always feel welcome and at home in Bruges. Uh, it was a city founded by Danes. Give or take, uh, at least a thousand years ago, uh, the Vikings, they were here and they built a settlement. Uh, those Vikings, they were wanderers. Uh, they navigated uh, the seas. The thing is that in the northern seas, it's not an easy thing to do as they did, which was to navigate by the sun. But these Vikings, they had a trick up their sleeve. And that was a piece of mineral called a sunstone. It's a mineral that allows you to polarize the light and then to help you find the sun even when it's hidden behind clouds. And like those Vikings back in the days, Europe today needs to find its way. We're in the middle of not one but two great transitions to an economy that is both digital and green. And that is changing the world that we know in fundamental ways. To tackle climate change, we have to change the way that we power our world. And that is the transformation so complete that it has only happened once or twice before in human history. And at the same time, our economy will have to adapt to a digital future. And that is a future that can offer companies of all sizes the chance to become more uh, competitive, more productive. It's also an economy where waves of new technology will come even faster. So our ability to innovate will make the difference between taking the lead or falling behind. And when one where scale will be increasingly important as big networks, large collections of data become the key to competitiveness in many, many different industries. Those challenges, they pose enormous opportunities for Europe. And the great task that we face today is to put the right policies in place to help European industry get ready to grasp those opportunities. This is not a simple matter because the twin transitions, they come at a time when global markets are shifting. Global competition, protectionism, market distortions, trade tensions, quite fundamental challenges to our rule-based uh, system. These things are on the rise. My guess is that you share with me a sense of uncertainty, a feeling that it's not a given what will be the outcome. But like those Vikings, Europe also have has a sunstone, a sunstone that can help us find our way despite the clouds of uncertainty, our European single market. For more than 60 years, we've been working to build a European market where goods and services and people can move freely so that we can make the most of Europe's scale to build strong, and competitive industries for the future. It's a huge benefit for businesses to be at home in a big market where they can grow, where they can gather their strength. American companies, they have that. Chinese companies, they have that as well. And thanks to the single market, European companies have that too, no matter how small a country they may come from. 
And that gives Europeans the scale that they need. The scale that we need to make these twin transition to a green and digital economy. Digital technologies, they are hugely important enablers and they can unlock opportunities for our industries. And that is why the data strategy that we published uh, last month, here we propose to make scale of our single market by creating European data spaces in the industries where we excel, that could be manufacturing, that could be transport. And the same is true for the industrial strategy that we'll publish next week and the strategy for small and medium-sized businesses that will come with it. Because this strategy will set out how we will support the transition to a digital and more green European industry. And, of course, one that at the same time improves our global competitiveness. And strengthening the single market will be at its heart. Because a single market that covers 30 different countries will never be something that we can take for granted. I think about it a bit like a lawn. It may look tidy, very nice today, but if you do not cut the grass regularly, well, it will get tangled, it will get overgrown. It's never a thing that you can take for granted. And this is where competition comes in. There is a reason why competition rules have been part of our treaty since the very first day. Because our markets need competition to reach its potential in order to serve as well in our role as consumers and customers. The single market gives us a well-tuned instrument to play on, but the competition rules allow the best players to have the chance to produce the finest music which that instrument can make. And the competition rules, they do that when they stop governments and businesses from rebuilding the barriers that our single market rules have removed. They do that when competition drives innovation forward. Because it's one thing for us to invest in, in research, in innovation, that helps European businesses of all sizes to find their resources to develop new products. But the thing is that that investment only really makes sense when businesses feel the need to innovate. And competition provides that need because you need to innovate in order to survive, in order to stay relevant for consumers and customers in the marketplace. And the competition rules help us make most of the single markets when they help European companies become the European champions that we need. Because you don't build strong champions by picking a favorite and, and uh, protecting them from competition in Europe. You do that by giving everyone a fair chance, big as well as small, to grow, to compete, without being held back by unfair competition. After all, the champions that we need, they're not just the biggest companies. What we need are companies, big as well as small, that are the best in the world at what they do, and that they share the success with Europeans by creating jobs and paying taxes. So competition rules and competition in itself is an essential part on, on every, any industrial strategy because there can be no competitiveness without fair competition. And that is true of global markets just as well as it is here in Europe. Our businesses need a level playing field to reach, reach their full potential. And we need to be assertive in defense of fair competition globally 
as we are here in Europe. I come from a landscape in the western part of Denmark, somewhat familiar to this landscape that we pass today. It's absolutely flat. You have then the benefit, of course, of the dome of the sky. But we have sort of this social rule that uh, when you invite someone to your home, you expect them to invite you back. Otherwise, eventually, you stop inviting. We say that the one tjeneste er den anden værd. I don't expect your Danish to be that good. So uh, I think there's a fair translation to do it in English to say one good turn deserves another. And in global markets, we should not put ourselves in a position where we only do good turns without expecting anything in return. Of course, we can't just rely on our European competition rules to uh, preserve a level playing field beyond the single market. There is, of course, a limit to our jurisdiction. And this is why, as long as ago as in 2012, uh, the Commission put forward its first proposal for an international procurement instrument. And that instrument would mean that we can act if countries whose uh, companies have access to our procurement markets don't let European companies compete on fair terms in theirs. I hope that this proposal will soon become law. But this is also why we prepare what we call a carbon uh, border adjustment. Of course, in line with WTO rules. Because making Europe climate neutral by 2050 is a good thing. Not just for Europe, but for the entire world, for our planet. And European businesses that work very, very hard to cut emissions, well, they shouldn't be undercut by others abroad who aren't doing their bit to do the same. And when European businesses suffer from imports of dumped or subsidized goods, well, we need to act firmly with the trade defense instruments that we modernized in the Commission's last term of office in order to make them faster and in order to make them more effective. Because trade and investment is good for Europe, but they need to be fair. And when we do a good turn, we should get something back. And that is not happening if foreign businesses can freely buy European companies, but the countries they come from do not let our companies do the same. Or if foreign companies use subsidies to set up their businesses in Europe, or to buy European businesses, or to bid for public tender with artificially low prices. We now have rules, and they will start to apply from October, to coordinated action across Europe to make sure that foreign direct investment uh, does not undermine our security or public order. And earlier this year, we agreed with the U US and Japan on ways to improve the WTO rules against harmful subsidies. And right now, we're working on new powers to protect fair competition. Powers that would allow us to deal, as one example, uh, with the harm that foreign subsidies and state ownership can do to competition in Europe. By the end of June, we should publish a white paper that would allow you also to discuss and to give inputs as to how these ideas would work in practice. We need these new tools in order to protect fair competition in global markets. But obviously, we also need to make sure that the tools we have already that they remain and stay fit for purpose. 
because our economy will suffer if we don't have the right tools to promote competition to stay competitive. So this work is part of a much bigger pro project which we started in the Commission's last term of office to make sure that we have the right powers and the rules to ensure our competition efficiently and effectively in a changing world. And President von der Leyen has asked me to take this project forward, evaluating and reviewing Europe's competition rules. And this is a work that covers all we do on antitrust, on state aid, and also on mergers. In my first mandate, uh, we launched a review of some of our merger procedures. We also asked three special advisors to produce an independent report on competition in a digitized world. And in January last year, we began a fitness check to collect information as to whether or not our state aid rules really work or not. Because to get these changes right, there is one thing that's a given. And that is that we have to listen to the people who use these rules or who benefit from these rules. And that will be businesses of all sizes, from every member state, no matter the size of that member state. That would be from governments, but also from non-governmental organizations. That would be from consumer groups, and that would be from unions. Because when we look at our rules, it is to make them work better for the people who benefit from them. And, of course, in order to make sure that they also serve the opportunities and challenges that comes with the green and digital uh, transition. For instance, state aid rules, they have quite an impact uh, on how we deal with the huge investment that we need to make Europe climate neutral by 2050. You may have heard about our Sustainable Europe uh, Investment Plan. Well, the idea is to make a trillion euros available for investment. Quite a lot of money by the end of the month. The thing is that it could sort of let you assume that it then doesn't really matter how you spent it. But actually, the truth is just the opposite. Having the right conditions as to how you spent, of course, helps you to do as much as possible with the money available. And the rules that we have on state aid, well, they can help us do exactly that by using competition to drive down costs. There's been a remarkable fall in the cost of supporting renewable energy since the state aid rules began to require competitive bidding to hand out that money. In Germany, the subsidy, the cost of supporting solar power has been cut in half. Some offshore uh, wind projects in Europe now happen without any subsidy at all. And the money that Europe saves, well, they can be invested elsewhere to speed up the transition without costing the taxpayer more money. And the state aid rules can also help us make the most out of what private sector can do. Because it is a fundamental rule and common sense that taxpayers' money shouldn't crowd out private investment. It should add something extra. It should be that thing that makes things happen, not just replacing investment that businesses would have done anyway. And the last thing is that when they're well done, well, then the state aid rules also make sure that money is spent without harming competition. Because we need to tackle climate change, but we need to do it in a way that preserves competition as a tool to keep our economy innovative and strong and competitive. So the state aid rules are a vital part of the green transition. 
not a barrier, but an enabler. And it's important that we keep them up to date so they can support the investment that we need. And that is why we have decided to speed up the things that we do, the rules on state aid of energy and environment, so that they can be in place, renewed by the end of next year. We're also about to complete our work on new rules for state aid to energy intensive industries to cope with higher electricity costs from our common emission trading system. These draft new rules, and of course, again, we put them out for consultation with the people who need them. That will end next week, so if you are among the people who needs or benefits from these rules, mm, that's a write us. But the thing is, on the one hand side, they should support the businesses. On the other hand side, they shouldn't undermine our environmental goals. So companies who get the aid, of course, should still have an incentive to cut their emissions by becoming more energy efficient. And that's a very classical example of the balancing act of our different rules. On the one hand side, the need to stay competitive. On the other hand side, to drive that part of that competitiveness is to be efficient in your use of energy. But our state aid rules, they can also make it possible for governments across Europe, in a truly pan-European fashion, to pool their resources and to fund an innovation that benefits the entire union. We call this for rules that support important projects of common European interests. And it's already happening. They open the way for governments from different European countries to come together with businesses to promote breakthrough innovation. And, of course, since taxpayers have chipped in, that they share the knowledge created widely also with businesses that may not have had the chance to be part of the project and part of getting the subsidy. Now we have made two large EU-wide uh, projects uh, possible, developing things like low-power microchips and more environmentally friendly batteries. And low-power microchips is not something that is just something common that we need. As we speak, our digital uh, tools and services, they are set to have the same carbon footprint as all our flying. So we definitely want to get the use of power down. Experience show, though, that these rules that we now have been using twice, they could be clearer. Procedures could be smoother. So we are also bringing forward our review of these rules so that they can be in place in hopefully a better way by the end of 2021. I guess you all make your efforts when it comes to green choices. Bikes, maybe no, not so much meat. You may fly a little less. Everyone is contributing one way or another. And so is every region in Europe. But the thing is that some regions, they will have to do more than other regions. There are regions on this continent that still depend to a very, very large degree on digging up fossil fuels or on industries that produce a lot of greenhouse gases. This is why our just transition mechanism will make 100 billion euros available to support these regions while they convert their economies to clean industries. And this is a question of solidarity. And it should work with, not undermine, the solidarity that Europe shows through our cohesion policies to help the poorest regions catch up. Because we want to be climate neutral, but we don't want to leave our fundamental values back here in 2020. We want cohesion and solidarity to follow us all the way to being climate neutral. Alongside these preparations for the green transition, we also make sure that we use the powers uh, that we need 
to promote competition in a digital world. Digital markets, they move fast. And obviously, we need to be able to gain the speed to keep up with them. Otherwise, competition will falter and com com competitiveness will suffer. Many of the biggest tech companies in the world, you know them all, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, they didn't even exist 25 years ago. Now they have hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of users. And with that thought, that's thoughts of growth comes, of course, not only new challenges to competition, but also threats to competition. In a digital world, and here size very often is the key to success, while well, growing companies can very fast reach the point where the markets simply tip in their favor and competition is lost forever. So we have been working with ways to figure out, well, how to deal with cases faster. Sometimes we would reduce fines for companies that will cooperate. But just to say one thing, because I hear and I understand and I share the call to work faster. This is a union built on the rule of law. And we can do a number of different things, but we cannot compromise on the fact that every company that we question have the full right to defend themselves. Because yes, we want to make sure that we are also competitive in a digital world, but again, we don't want to leave our values of a rule of law to be left in the analog economy. One way, maybe, to square the circle can be interim measures. Uh, last year, we ordered Broadcom to temporarily stop enforcing contracts that prevented customers from buying chip from anyone else. That was the first time in nearly 18 years that we used this power. But don't you worry. Now we found this tool in our toolbox. Now it's on the workbench. And of course, we're ready to use it again. We also have a look at the remedies we use to ro roll back the effects of a company's actions on competition. In the past, competition enforcers have often found that it's enough to ask a company to cease and desist. Stop what you're doing. Don't put anything in place with the equivalent effect. Work done, case over. Well, not so much. Because in today's world, we will have to go further. If the market is already tipped and it's no longer possible for others to compete, well, then we may have to order these companies also to neutralize the effects that they have had on competition by their illegal behavior. And that will be a very uh, important theme uh, for us uh, in April. Uh, I'm going to the US and we will have a workshop with uh, our colleagues from the US Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission because this is not only a question for us. This is the global question for uh, competition law enforcers all over. And meanwhile, we'll need to make sure that we're getting the most of the rules that we already let us step in to prevent harm. And one of the things that allows us to step in to prevent harm, well, that is merger rules. For 30 years now, merger rules, they have relied on the turnover of the companies involved. It would be the turnover that would decide whether a merger should be notified to us or not. The thing is that in a digital world, it's not always a given that the turnover is a reliable guide to the company's importance. So in the last few years, we have been looking at, well, 
how to make sure that we actually see the mergers that matter, even if the turnover involved is very small. And in the second half of this year, we'll publish the result of our work on turnover thresholds, along with some consideration as to whether or not we could rely more on the system of referring mergers from national competition authorities uh, to the Commission, so to make sure that important mergers do not escape our attention. But even with all of those powers working well, well, the competition <coughs> rules, they don't always allow us to step in before the market has tipped. The rules we have today, they do not stop big companies from pushing markets towards the tipping point unless those companies are already dominant in the market. And that's not just an issue in digital markets. In the last two uh, decades, four-fifths of European industry has become more concentrated, with the biggest companies taking an ever larger share of the market. Some competition authorities, they have the power to step in, even though the businesses have not broken competition rules. And we are thinking what we can learn from their experience about how to head off a looming threat to competition. The thing is, well, that's my guess, that no matter what we might conclude uh, on those thoughts, that won't give us a cast iron promise that the markets will never tip. We may still find ourselves dealing with platforms that have become so dominant that they are effectively private regulators, that they have the rules or they have the power to set the rules for the market that depend on those platforms because they basically own it. And that doesn't necessarily have to cause harm to competition if they use that sort of de facto regulatory power in a way that let fair competition thrive. Of course, they can do that. The thing is that we know from experience, and so will other competition authorities, like the French Autorité de la Concurrence, well, we know from our experience that it's not necessarily so that big companies will do that, set rules that cater for fair competition. In fact, our competition enforcement has taught us a lot about the sort of behavior that dominant companies uh, may have, behavior that stops the markets, which they regulate, from working well. And we can draw on that experience to design regulation that clearly set up what those platforms can do with their power and what they can't. Last but not least, and I will eventually come to the end. It's important that we cover all bases and deal with competition problems wherever we find them. Because in times of change, when much is at stake, well, we have to get the most out of Europe's potential. And to do that, we need to have fair competition. That being said, we shouldn't stop companies from working together to develop new innovative ideas. Quite the opposite. Uh, for instance, Europe's businesses, they need to be able to pool their data, to enable them to share data so that they can develop. For instance, when it comes to artificial intelligence, it need a, needs quite a lot of high quality data to be able to do that. And that sort of cooperation is good news for Europe, just as long as we can give the guidance so that it will not become a cover up for a cartel. And this is why we're also looking at our horizontal uh, cooperation guidelines to make sure that companies know that they have the clear rules that they themselves can assess 
well, this is how we can cooperate without harming competition in the process. We just finished a public consultation and we'll soon launch a study because we need more evidence as to how to make this work. And of course, we will consult again because the rules only work when we've consulted with the people who depend on the rules to work. And we should also make it good use of the powers that we have to make sure that we can give informal guidance if ever needed, to make sure that businesses feel this is certainty. Now I know what to do. And we should also make sure that we use our power to decide formally that antitrust rules don't apply to an agreement where the agreement definitely do not harm competition. So when we replace doubt with uncertainty, new possibilities can unlock the uh, cooperation. I hope I give you an idea of pretty busy years ahead of us, but there's no getting around it. Because the twin transitions, they are happening right now. And the thing is, they don't stop and wait uh, while we decide what to do. It is right now we take the decision that allows us to shape these transitions, instead of just letting them shape us as a tsunami. And we will do a lot of different things as well. Uh, you see how e-commerce is growing? Well, that sort of gives us the need to make sure that we have an up-to-date rule book for vertical agreements between buyers and sellers. And it's not only how the market works, it's also the market in itself that changes. It's uh, not a new issue for us, but we have to, when we do our work, to define the scope of a market. Last December, we decided to get started to look at the notice that tells our parties, our partners, how we define markets. Then I say to my people, well, maybe we could even change sort of the headline of what we do, because it is kind of strange that we call it market definition, when what we do is basically to take note of how buyers and sellers actually act in the marketplace. Just to reflect my own disappointment, when I came in the first mandate and learned that I did not have a magic pen to define the marketplace. On the contrary, what I had was a number of humble methodologies to assess what consumers and businesses were actually doing. But the thing is, it changes. In no price markets, in digital markets, things, they are new. And again, of course, we will consult on it and we'll do it soon. Last but not least, it's important that we do not see a cartel if there is no cartel. And one of the obvious places is to say, well, a company, a platform, may call the people depending on the platform independent, self-employed. But that doesn't necessarily make them self-employed. That doesn't necessarily make them lawyers or dentists or notaries. That may just put them in a very vulnerable position because they can be tricked into believing that they cannot unionize and establish themselves a fair negotiating position. And that, of course, we will help do as well to make sure that people can make their union, that they can come together to make sure that they can establish fair working conditions. Also, when your way of addressing or entering the labor force and the marketplace is via a platform. 1956, a committee chaired by Paul Henry Spock, one of the guiding spirits of this very college. He prepared the report which laid the groundwork for the Treaty of Rome. And that report began bleakly, noting that Europe's econ economic position 
was weakened, its influence diminished. But the choices which Europe made back then for a social market economy with fair competition in a European single market, that have since made Europe the best place to live in history ever. And today, like Spark and the other founders of our union, we have big decisions to make. But we are more fortunate than they were, at least in one way. Because they could only hope that the European way, single market, fair competition, would succeed. We know that it works. And because of that, we can safely say that Europe's future, well, that doesn't lie in becoming more like America or more like China, but in making Europe more like herself. Thank you. Thanks for having shared with us uh, your truly strategic vision of what competition policy and competition policy instruments can really contribute to help us uh, meeting the challenges of the double transition, the green transition and the digital uh, transition. Uh, I was personally struck by the fact how much emphasis uh, you also placed on really evidence-based uh, based policy making on widespread consultations and the need to constantly revise the instruments. I think if uh, um, this subject would have been addressed 20 years ago, there would have been much less emphasis on widespread consultation, on constant revision of instruments. So I think it's an impressive indication of the willingness uh, to dynamically respond to the, to the challenges. It uh, makes your agenda surely a very heavy one. Uh, but it is one uh, which uh, certainly is in all um, our interest. I think uh, you may also, because I see some citizens of Bruges this evening also, also here, uh, some of the citizens of Bruges may have started thinking about their Viking origins, uh, but I think <laughs> this we will not explore now in the discussion. You have kindly agreed to respond to, to questions. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, right away open up um, the Q&A session. Um, so um, if there are questions, please, if you would say your uh, name and um, uh, where you're coming from. Hello, my name is David, coming from Romania and studying here in the Paul department. Uh, thank you for your speech. Thank you for your presence here. My question is related to uh, actually a, maybe a paradox, as I would see it. You mentioned a lot of times the the focus on breakthrough innovation in Europe, and at the same time, you're a champion of, of uh, regulating tech giants. And I wonder, how do you manage to leverage and you know, still pursue the tech giants who some would say um, are over, over, overreaching, overreaching with their powers, and at the same time protect small businesses, which some critics would say were affected by GDPR? Because obviously tech giants, big companies, find it a bit easier to cope with regulations, while small companies find it a bit harder. Thank you. Usually, um, if time allows, I, I always try to take questions one by one, because then it's much easier for you to see when I try to evade them. <laughs> and this is a tricky one. Uh, because it's obviously a point that for businesses that can uh, employ hundreds of lawyers, it's much easier to make sure that you get a setup uh, that is uh, absolutely, you know, by the book, where it can be very difficult for a smaller company who do not have a back office full of lawyers to make sure that everything is right. Uh, so the legislator has been thinking quite a lot about that to make sure that you have the obligations that sort of match what you're doing. That if, you, if you're in the business of collecting data and using data, you have a different set of obligations than if you're in the business of 
uh, only needing uh, the data from people in order to send them an invoice to make sure that you have these differences well uh, reflected. And second, uh, to make sure that data protection uh, agencies in member states, that they give guidance, that they didn't come out on the first day of the new regulation uh, sort of writing out fines, but instead of taking the time to give the guidance as to how can this actually uh, be made to happen. Uh, one of the things that I myself are, are waiting for is for the market also to be part of the answer to your question. Uh, because I think there will be a lot of uh, businesses, in particular smaller ones, who would want to have a plug and play solution to exactly these issues. Just as well as I think that many citizens, like myself, would like to have plug and play solutions to make sure that we can get full use of our digital citizens' right of the GDPR. Um, we try to implement uh, sort of the consequence of your question in a, in a saying or a motto for, for doing legislation, which is called uh, think small first. First to think, can a smaller business actually manage this regulation? Uh, and one of the reasons why it's a good thing is that very often when you start out as a legislator, and I know that because I was one for many years, then you say, oh, it would also be nice to and then even if you have started out with a quite slim agenda, very targeted, to do exactly what you want to do, then while you're at it, why not also, you know, the same things that happens in the supermarket when you come home with 20 things and only with 10 things on your list, list when you went shopping. So we really try to control ourselves. I would agree with you that still, this is still work in progress. Also because I think that some of the ones who are easily capable of living up to the rules, they also make it a thing that it is difficult to live up to the rules instead of making it maybe more plain and simple. Hello, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is George, I'm, I'm Greek and I'm from the law department. Uh, you talked about interim measures uh, when dealing with the digital markets, but do you see other ways, to sp other alternatives to speed up uh, the enforcement of competition law uh, other than the interim measures? How we can speed up the enforcement with other ways? One of, one of the things that... Uh, that I have learned in, um, in the first uh, mandate is that it's not necessarily so that everything will have to be solved with a case-by-case -case competition law enforcement. That we may have to call in also regulation. Uh, and this is why I find it uh, inspiring what they are doing, uh, for instance, uh, in the C with the CMA in the UK. Uh, they have a tool that allows them to do kind of a market investigation uh, and without necessarily finding illegal behavior in some businesses, but finding that the market doesn't really work, that there is foreclosure, very high barriers to entry, that it's maybe that there is a tendency that it might tip, then they can go in and, and order remedies in this market. Of course, there are no fines because they've found, find, found no illegal behavior, but they can sort of, before things get wrong, do some things to prevent it. So that is one food for thought. We are looking at their experiences to see, well, is that the kind of, of powers that you would want to have? The second thing is that a number of our markets, they have tipped. We have a number of markets where the tech giants, they are dominant. You see that in our casework. We have found Google to be dominant in a number of markets. <clears throat> Here, when they are de facto the private regulator, it may be a good idea to reinterpret what, the kind, what is the kind of responsibility you have as a dominant company. Because it was one thing to be dominant back in the old analog days. If you wanted to expand in a neighboring market, you would still need brick and mortar shop, you would need sales assistants, inventory, people to do the audits, all kind of stuff. It's a completely different thing today. 
So we might want to say, well, there's, there's a number of things that you can do, and there's a number of things that you cannot do if you have become dominant in this marketplace. And that is, of course, to prevent harm from happening so that if harm is happening, we can use our resources efficiently to say, well, this is not how things they were supposed to be. Uh, but I think there'll have to be that kind of thinking because otherwise we will be uh, quite slow still. Because the thing is that there is an, an inbuilt asymmetry here between uh, the one who is doing the illegal uh, behavior and the law enforcer without any other comparison. Uh, if someone breaks into your house, it may take literally five minutes before they in, take something, and they're out again. Uh, before the police may have found someone that they suspect of the crime, and the case is by its end, obviously that has taken way, 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 way longer than the break-in took. And I think we'll have to respect in a union built on the rule, rule of law that there will be that kind of asymmetry. But as said, we can do much more in prevention and with interim measures and better technology ourselves, we can also speed that up when we do the casework. Thanks very much. Is a question? Um, Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, my name is Stefan and I'm also from Romania. And um, you talked about a global level playing field and fairness and competition rules and, and, and standards uh, that we should apply across the board. And uh, my curiosity is whether we can really talk about moving forward in competition policy that enforces these and sort of has these aims and goals in the green and digital world if we're not necessarily seeing that at the European level. Um, I opine that uh, some member states and some markets are maybe have been left behind or some market players think that they have been left behind um, in some member states of the European Union. And so can we really move towards this broad and sort of um, all-encompassing scope without really addressing our homegrown problems. Thank you. No, but maybe we can do both. Um, we, we have a, a global economy, uh, but we do not have global competition law enforcement. Uh, so what we do to kind of to have a proxy for uh, global competition law enforcement is to work closely together in the international competition network. Uh, that is a network that is very high on substance and very low on protocol. Uh, basically, it's working groups that work throughout the year, and then there is, uh, is an annual uh, for decisions to be taken from these different working groups and for people to come together to share their, their casework, uh, which, for instance, allows us to, to align uh, merger procedures so that we can cut red tape for businesses because many big mergers, they would be um, notifiable in a number of jurisdictions. So we can do something uh, globally that is not fast, oof, but we can step by step uh, actually uh, get there. Um, when we look at, at sort of our, our homegrown uh, competition issues, what I hear often is actually not sort of classical competition problems, that would be single market issues, where uh, companies in some member states, they feel that there was a promise in the single market, but what really happened here? Because they don't see that they easily and without hassle uh, can go to the next member state. Not because of language problems, um, not because of, uh, of standardization issues, not because of legislation, but because that all of a sudden there is a barrier that weren't there before. Um, and this is why I use this metaphor of a loan, that the single market is not something we have and can take for granted. You really have to cut it every week to make sure that there's not all of a sudden a tree or weeds or whatever. And I know, because I have a stuga in Sweden, and what was once a loan is now a wood give or take five years, you have a wood. Uh, and this is why uh, enforcement in the single market is one of the things very, very high uh, on our agenda. I know this is old school. I know it may sound like nothing, but making the single market work is probably the best thing that we can do to ensure European competitiveness. Because this is what they have in the US. 
This is what they have in China. This is what we owe to European companies for them to get some scale. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Eloise Rion and I'm from France, as you probably would have guessed by now. Um, so my question is in light of uh, the Commission's decision on the merger of Siemens and Alstom and in light of the merger that was notified to the Commission between Bombardier and Siemens, uh, what, would you, what would be your reaction now to the statement of Bruno Le Maire that uh, le droit de la concurrence est européen est obsolète, and especially in light of what you just said at the end of your speech, that Europe should not uh, necessarily look like the US or China to be com competitive. Thank you. Well, as I, as I said in the end, uh, we don't have hope that our European model will work. We know that it works because we have seen how this model has built prosperity over now 70 years. And, and the interesting thing about the debate that we have had after the Siemens Alstom prohibition is that the Siemens Alstom prohibition is a very poor example of uh, not being able to uh, have European champions or big European companies. Uh, first, because we are dealing with two European uh, global market leaders, amazing companies, both Siemens and Alstom. Uh, and second, because it was a merger that could have happened. Um, it's a merger in uh, signaling and rolling stock, primarily. Uh, we had no issues uh, with uh, metros, trams, shunting locomotives, uh, intercity trains, high-speed trains, urban signaling. We had two issues left. One was in mainline signaling. Mainline signaling is what keeps you safe when you go by train. You want it to work, I tell you. We want to invest. We have created a new European standard when it comes to mainline signaling because we want more trains, for obvious reasons, more regularity, more cross-border. We want to use our rolling stock better. So we need to keep prices down on mainline signaling so that member states can afford to invest. Here, we would have a merger to a very, very, very high market share. So very high risk of prices going up. Second problem was in very high speed trains. And these are trains that go maybe 300 kilometers per hour. So we're in a market where you can actually compete with flying. This is also what you want. We looked very carefully at the markets, because also here, the merger would produce very, very high market share. Could we then buy a very high speed train somewhere else? Sad thing, no. Because the Chinese are doing very high speed trains, but only in China, not outside of China. So of course, we asked the businesses to solve these problems, and they said they couldn't solve these problems, or they wouldn't solve this problem. I'm not the judge of that. And then we are left with no other choice than to prohibit the uh, merger. So it wasn't sort of a blanket prohibition. It was two specific pro uh, problems uh, within uh, very crucial areas that the businesses couldn't or wouldn't solve. And that, of course, makes it a very strange poster boy for competition rules not, being, uh, not working. Uh, because what we want is indeed for businesses to merge if they still are challenged uh, within Europe. That's the point. And within the last mandate, we have created uh, global businesses in cement, but still challenged in Europe, in dairy, but still challenged in Europe, in uh, glasses and frames, ex uh, exilo loxotica, but still challenged in Europe, and a very important market, beers global beer brewer, but still challenged in Europe. And that's the point, that we don't question the business logic as long as you still accept the challenge, because it's the challenge that keeps you competitive. 
Um, and so far, that has served us as European consumers and customers very well. Because one of the things that I think we sometimes oversee is that you may be uh, a business, but you're also a customer. Because the European value change, they are quite granular. So you always yourself also need a competitive market to serve your inputs for you yourself to be competitive when you want to sell uh, what it is that you produce. That being said, I just spent, give or take, 30 minutes of your time to say, well, we go through everything we do to make sure that the rules that we have, that they are fit for purpose. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, for your interesting speech. Uh, my name is Christian. Uh, I'm also from uh, Romania and uh, Moldova. I wanted to ask you uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, if uh, the European Union can do better in uh, making uh, Europe as attractive uh, to uh, digital companies as in the US Silicon Valley is and uh, what improvements or changes can be do done uh, with regards to that. Thank you. Thanks for the question. We will make it three final questions. So there are two other opportunities. Uh, there's one over there. Hello, uh, thank you. I'm Tom from Belgium, from the law department as well. Uh, so I have a question on the interaction between competition law on the one side and public policy objectives on the other side. So we've heard you uh, many times in the past saying whether we speak about uh, sustainability or privacy, for example, that these stakes were primarily the role of uh, sexual regulation. But my question is, uh, shouldn't we see competition law as a complement rather than a substitute? And um, so should should competition law not intervene when regulation either is not existing or is not really implemented? Uh, so, thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, perhaps, um, ah, <laughs> maybe we change sides. <laughs> we go over to, uh, to you. Is there, with, just a moment. The microphone is coming. The microphone is coming. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Marine from France, and I had a question on the nature of sanctions. Because for now, usually, uh, infri infringers, they are fined when they infringe, co infringe competition law. And I was wondering, is it dissuasive enough? Should member states decide to criminalize anti-competitive anti behaviors? So it means, should infringer infringers face jail time? Thank you. Well, I, I tell you, if I start from the last question, one could get the temptation. Um, some member states, they would also have um, sanctions uh, within the criminal law. Uh, and one of the things they say, well, one of the reasons why, why that seems to be effective is then, is what they tell me, you have a different discussion in the boardroom if there is a risk that whatever you do will take you to jail. Uh, the thing is that that also takes another standard of proof, obviously. Uh, and my guess would be that that would uh, make our casework uh, even uh, more uh, uh, time consuming than what it is today. And it would make it more difficult for the markets to move on uh, and hopefully regain competitiveness. Uh, what I agree is that it's not enough with a fine. And today, uh, the fines that we hand out, they are an average between four and 6% of global turnover in affected markets. But the fine is just a punishment for illegal past behavior. That's one element of our decision. Second element of our decision would be the cease and desist. Stop what you're doing 
do not put anything in practice that has the same effect. The problem is that since markets are moving faster and we are not as fast as the markets, harm may already be done. Uh, and this is why uh, I think it's important to figure out how to make sure that there's also market repair involved. Uh, as from uh, yesterday, if you buy a new Android phone, and if, if, uh, if Google products uh, search and, and Play Store is in installed, you would have a preference menu so that you can choose another search provider uh, than Google that is pre-installed. And that would also work as a default in your browser. Uh, and that is one way of trying to get um, the search and browser providers uh, that was in a very, very difficult position when Google tied um, the Play Store with search and browsing. Now remains to be seen how this will work, but it's one of the things that you can do to say, well, those who suffered from the illegal behavior should have another chance to come back and to present their product to consumers. Um, and what we will do in the future is to do more if it can be, of course, argued that this is a sensible thing to do, that there will be three elements of a decision. A fine to punish past behavior, to stop what you're doing, but also that you will have to do something positive in order to allow for competitors to come back. Can also be sharing of data, could be another example uh, of, uh, of what could be, uh, could be entailed. Uh, on the question of, uh, of competition law and, and public policy perspective, uh, I thought a lot about that uh, when we did the Bayer Monsanto merger. Uh, because there was a lot of people who said, well, this is, a, this is a merger that will allow the companies to combine um, uh, GMO and pesticides. And this will be a bad thing. So you have to ban this merger out of environmental uh, lines of arguing. But the thing is that I find that environment is even more important uh, than competition, believe it or not. And the thing is that in this situation, well, in our environmental rules, they were in place before Bayern Monsanto planned the merger, and they had to live up to those rules. They were in place while we did uh, uh, the merger investigation, and they were in place after. And I think it's very important that competition law enforcement is not put in uh, other policies' place because I think it's important that we maintain that it's our legislator, our democratically elected legislator, who sets the rules when it comes to uh, public policy uh, perspectives. Also because otherwise I think it will be very difficult for companies to figure out what was at stake here. Was that a question of competition or was it something something so if I go to court to challenge this decision, on what grounds should I tra challenge it? Um, so, you know, I'm all encouraging our legislator to make sure that where there are public policy perspectives, that they make them clear. Because that is the framework of the marketplace. And that has been, I think, the European model and the European choice. Because to get into answering the last question, we have been willing to sacrifice innovation. Take agriculture. There are many, many, many more pesticides invented that is being used in European agriculture. Many more. Many more pesticides. But we are making the active choice to say we will ban a number of pesticides because we will not experiment with our drinking water or with biodiversity even though maybe for some farmers this would be the pesticide they would need. We do not want to find that in our drinking water in 10 or 15 years. Could also be animal welfare. Probably the majority of farmers, they treat their animals absolutely fine. But since we have a sense that animal welfare is important, we do not take a chance that then the last ones, that we don't care. We care about all of them, 
which is why we put in regulations to secure animal welfare, I think we lose innovation because of that. But it's innovation that we don't want because we are balancing, being balancing out to say, well, this is important for us. We put in a frame about how you do your farming because of our drinking water, animal welfare, biodiversity. And that's a European model. We've been willing to do that. I think this is so strong because it reflects a public debate, a lot of arguing back and forth, and then some more, and then some more, and eventually a decision. And then you have a frame marketplace, and then you go compete. Uh, and this, of course, when it comes to make uh, the European market as attractive as in the US, I think the European market will forever be different from the US market because it's a social market economy. We really want workers to be able to unionize to have a better deal. When I worry about uh, concentration and an increasing part of uh, profits when it comes to uh, the economy, is because I find that there is a risk that it's not sufficiently shared with the workers because of concentration. So I think that forever the European marketplace will be a different place. But I think it can be, and to some degree is, as attractive. If you look at the uh, ecosystem of innovation in Europe, this is a very attractive place. Uh, some of the big tech companies, they have been on a shopping spree in Europe coming back with backs and backs and backs and backs of companies, taking them back home to the US. What we need in order for businesses to stay here is of course to uh, supply uh, financing, seed capital, the competence that you need to come on board, and for us as consumers to be sufficiently curious to try their products out. How many of you are testing other search engines than Google? This is quite good. I think there was at least 10. I was developing a rule that in any, any uh, congregation, there would be at least at most five, four, give or take. We have a German search engine called Clix. We have a French search engine called Quant. We have American competitors to Google, DuckDuckGo and Bing. If consumers are not curious, well, then new businesses will have no success. And that is also what makes a market interesting, that there are curious consumers. So we can do a lot of things to make the market attractive, excellent education, good funding, but we also need a curious uh, set of consumers. Of course, they are different. That's the point of their services. For instance, the European search engine, they tend to protect you, protect you from tracking. They tend to give you choices when it comes to privacy. They tend to be European. So, this is the end. Go do. Thanks very much again, uh, Mrs. Vice President, not only for your most enlightening speech, but also for having um, taken uh, so much time and effort to respond to the questions in detail. I'm particularly grateful that you have reminded us that at the heart of the European project, there are some fundamental choices, and these are choices which are based on values. And I think I speak in the name of all of us uh, if I wish you the best possible success with your heavy agenda in defending also our European values and choices. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.